cold snowy <coughs> night. Mm -hmm. We uh, really appreciate it. I want to thank Cousin Cause for having this and for inviting myself and all of us to be here. We're here today to talk about government, Wisconsin government, and some of the problems with our government. And I, as I look at it, we have problems in our our representative form of democracy. And uh, I think that uh, how we can improve them uh, is something that we should be talking about a little bit tonight. We're not going to solve things. People are in, imperfect by definition, so <laughs> government of people is not going to be perfect. But the bottom line, the bottom line as I see it, to uh, handling a representative democracy, and we're a representative democracy, is selecting good representatives. Bottom line to selecting good representatives, as I see it, is to have informed and involved citizens in a process by which those citizens can elect or select their uh, representatives. All the laws in the world aren't going to develop a good government if you don't have it implemented by good people. And so, the, as I see the bottom line is to get the right type of, of representation. We're a representative democracy, not a pure democracy, a representative democracy. So what I would like to address tonight, uh, is, at this point anyway, is something that I think is not as actively discussed in some things, but which in my opinion is probably more important than most things. And that's the selection of our state Supreme Court. As you all know, we have seven justices. They're elected for a 10-year term. But, as you all know, the, not the participation in these elections averages less than 20% in the spring elections. Some of our current justices uh, won their spring primaries by less than 5%. Uh, Justice uh, Reagan's in the spring of 2003 received 109,000 votes in the spring primary. Out of over, over 4 million of the voters. Uh, Justice uh, Ziegler, in the spring of 2007, got only 164,000 votes. Again, less than 5% of those uh, eligible to vote voted. And yet, these representatives are very powerful people. Very powerful people. <clears throat> they can override the governor. They can override all of us in the legislature. In fact, if you look at the four or three decisions which we come up with too frequently, one person, deciding person that in a four or three decision, it in effect can almost overrule all the other all the other representatives and elected and appoint representatives together. Um, you know, we've had a number of these four or three decisions in the court. One of the more Recent ones, of course, is on Act 10, where uh, four to three, the Supreme Court said that the uh, the legislature didn't have to pay any attention to uh, <coughs> didn't have to pay any attention to open meetings law. There's other four or three decisions. So I, when I was a president of the Senate, I, I sued the governor once, and uh, four or three decision only I won that one. <laughs> and uh, it was debating about uh, appropriations. Uh, the governor has the right to cut appropriations in the, his veto power, but then he has the right to cut uh, revenue, uh, cut the, uh, the, uh, the bonding levels. Now the Supreme Court said the bonding levels were not appropriations, he didn't have the right to cut that. A 4-3 decision. 4-3 decision, in fact, more recently, just this uh, last year, by a 4-3 vote, the Supreme Court decided that they could they got the the, re, the recruits problem of, of about uh, holding off on deciding uh, deciding cases in which uh, heavy campaign contributions were part. Anyway, the bottom line is that it's extremely important. And what what can we do? I, I think there's a lot of problems with our present system, uh, and, and but the, the solution. Uh, has never been revived at by uh, universally accepted by other states. In other words, it's interesting to see what other states have done. 
Uh, some states have, uh, uh, about half the states elect their Supreme Court. About half the states appoint them with some kind of a retention system or have a, a system of merits election. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, the four states surrounding up to four different ways. Illinois, they have a partisan election for the Supreme Court. And they're held in there, in there for 10 years. In Michigan, they have a partisan election for eight-year terms. In Minnesota, they have a nonpartisan election for six-year terms. In Iowa, they have a sort of merit selection in which uh, they make a recommendation to the governor to appoint someone, but then in one year, there's a retention election. And you so may remember what happened in Iowa. The Supreme Court in Iowa decided that the same-sex marriage was valid, and the next retention elections, two Supreme Court judges got knocked off. On that issue alone, it's uh, there, there is no set, as they say, accepted way of doing it. Uh, some states uh, um, <clears throat> in Rhode Island were appointed for life. Uh, in some states, the, the governor appoints without there being any kind of a, a, uh, a pre-selection. Um, I have discovered that in my surroundings that. The legislators from states where they elect Supreme Court judges do not have them appointed. The legislators from states where they're appointed like them. Like, there is no satisfaction. There is no, there is no uh, third term of satisfaction. But now, <clears throat> we have our problems with our elected system. For instance, money is a big problem. has been mentioned here. Any election, money is a big problem. And I don't want to go to that subject right now because I think we'll get to it later on. But Money and elections are a problem. No matter any time you have an election, money is a problem. Also, the court is becoming very partisan. And few people are participating, which I have pointed out. A very small group. Now, the merit system, merit uh, also has its problems. <clears throat> if you have a system where it's the uh, bar association, by the way, this is a system which the state journal likes, you have a bar association making some comments. Some, some suggestions, and you appoint them, you're depriving the voters of a chance to get involved. You're depriving individuals from even being considered. Say I wanted to run for the Supreme Court, under that system I couldn't do it, because there would be a clique of bar people that would nominate someone for the, uh, uh, probably the, uh, the governor to appoint, and anyone any other attorney or any other judge in the state is just out of the picture, not very representative government. And the uh, question is, who's going to make those recommendations? The Bar Association? Is it this small group within the Bar Association? Who's going to make the appointments? I can't imagine any governor appointing someone that he didn't like or she didn't like. And then the bottom line is, even if you have an appointed system, every state except Rhode Island, which is appointed for life, has a retention election or a re-election. In other words, after they're appointed, I hope after one year they're appointed, they have to face the voters. In some states, they have to face the voters. <coughs> so what have you gained? You've got the election uh, under this system, too. So anyway, uh, it doesn't, by the way, solve the problem of um, representative democracy because you're not having representatives there. Now, I want to just make a few seconds to, to say, I don't want to be all negative. I think there's things we can do under the present system. I think uh, money in politics is a big issue we we'll take later, but I think, I think we could have more full disclosure uh, than we have. In some states, they turn out voters pamphlets uh, where the government sends out a, a government publication with every candidate having a chance to get his picture in and put his page in. I think that some people talk about uh, having the judicial elections uh, uh, when there is uh, <coughs> more voters, like the fall, uh, in the other way. And we also have to have a strong, strong recusal rule. Of course, if you turn around to the sort of merit appointment system, <coughs> there are things that could be done there. Somehow, you're going to have to figure out you know, who, who does the appointments, who makes the recommendations, and if you don't avoid the, uh, the, the follow-up election, you haven't really accomplished too much. So, there are problems there, and uh, that's one of the things that I 
think we might want to talk about. Um, I want to say again that I appreciate the being here. And before I get done, I want to say that uh, we're going to miss people like Dale Schultz in the, in the legislature. He served uh, over 30 years. He has a value that uh, very few people have with us. With his time in the legislature, he served in leadership position. He was the majority leader for a number of years. And uh, he's a very able and very worthwhile legislator. Is the type of person I mean we should be encouraging to run for office because they're dedicated to help the federal government work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fred. I want to um, thank Common Cause and all the other sponsors for holding this and you all for coming out. And I also want to say that I am honored to uh, be in the presence of such fine public servants. Um, so we have a bunch of topics here tonight that we are supposed to be concentrating on and talking about. And um, can you see? Can you see with us here? Yeah. <coughs> and um, I was. Uh, you see? Yeah. Anything <laughs> <what? laughs> Sorry about that. I'm realizing the screen is not compatible with the seat. I was thinking of where my services would be most useful because obviously with just a couple minutes, six, seven minutes for each speaker, um, I can't go through all of these. And I was thinking of my classes and um, how redistricting is such a visual thing. And so I thought I could do uh, show you some slides so you could kind of wrap your mind around some of the aspects of redistricting. So, the term gerrymander, there's the original map there, is the beast. Um, Elbridge Gary, his real name is Gary, um, <coughs> was a, uh, one of the first practitioners in Massachusetts. Uh, so this is, this is something that goes back to the beginning of our republic. Um, and so, as, as was mentioned before, do we pick our elected officials or do our elected officials pick us? And you can see from those um, various uh, uh, patterns you can make um, minorities into majorities uh, by carefully drawing boundaries. Uh, notice on the left, you know, the red dots, uh, there's fewer of them, but you can draw those so-called districts so that they're majorities in two. So it's really a mathematical and, and spatial problem. Um, the thing is that we've always had this, but never to the extent of uh, the level of sophistication now with GIS mapping, with the sort of big data that um, companies, law firms have, we can redistrict down to the street, actually down to the household level. And in fact, they do do that to keep various people <laughs> running for re-election out of their district. Um, so the process, it depends uh, on who controls, has unified control of the state legislature. So in 2010, you can see in red, the Republicans had a tremendous year in the state legislature, and it was the, it was the right year for them to have it, if you want to control um, drawing districts. And so that was, I think, a carefully thought through and, and really successful victory at the state level, which is not really even on the radar. And all those red states, they controlled the process. The blue states, the Democrats controlled the process. Um, and in the, the white colored states, it is either a commission or it was a split, um, divided government, and that either resulted in um, compromise or the courts, it gets thrown to the courts. And that's the way it was in Wisconsin uh, the last cycle. It was thrown to the courts because there was a divided government. And so just to show you some of these creatures, um, you might know this district, which um, it was originally drawn to protect Dan Ross and Kowski, who was in the middle. And the two, this was the Hispanic district. The north part is, is a Puerto Rican neighborhood. The south part was Hilson. And you had to have a Hispanic district, but Dan Rasinkowski didn't give up his, his chunk. And so they drew this thing all the way to DuPage County. And those little skinny lines are the Eisenhower Expressway. You could throw a rock over the fence from one side of the expressway to the other, and you would miss the district. Um, there's a district in Georgia. Here's from the latest round, and what's really spectacular here, look at this one in Maryland, which was a Democratic gerrymander. Um, and you can see, I've never seen this before. Um, look at this one in Florida. 
it is not contiguous. It's contiguous only with the water. And so now they're starting to do this. You see in Cleveland, uh, right there, there's a gap. Um, on that map there, I don't know if you can see the arrow. There's a gap, and they're just saying, well, the water touches one part of the district and then touches another part of the district, therefore it's connected. As far as I know, there's not a bridge that goes out from Lake Erie. But um, the districts are becoming even, these are federal uh, congressional districts, by the way. They're becoming even less contiguous than they've ever been, and in fact, non-contiguous. Um, so this is achieved, controlling uh, outcomes is often achieved through two strategies, what we call packing and cracking. This is an example of cracking, and this is Austin, <coughs> Texas, which is sort of a blue island and a red state. And the midterm redistricting they did then, which was controversial in itself, a whole other story, um, it took Austin and split it into three parts and attached them to long, all the way down to the Mexican border, long <coughs> Republican districts, which turned what should have been one kind of community of interest, uh, a blue district, into three Republican districts. Um, here in Wisconsin, it's usually achieved in the opposite way, which is what we call packing, where you put the opponent in as few districts as possible, but super dense. And you can see Milwaukee here in, in pink. And in the new districts, it's much smaller. And that's because it's lost outlying areas, close in suburbs, um, mixed areas. And it's become a far more intense Democratic district. Um, this was from an older map from the General Central. These were proposed, and now they've largely become law. Notice the other big change, the third district, by adding very democratic Stevens Point in Portage County, becomes a much more democratic district. It's been condensed. And that was to turn Dave Obie's district into a much more than it was Republican district. So Obie's old district lost that whole area. And so the bottom line is between these two districts, the Republicans did gain Democrats uh, lose, it's just that you have now two less competitive districts where there used to be two fairly competitive districts. Um, the worst example is here. Um, and again, this isn't just about redrawing the districts to your party's advantage, it's also about making districts safer for incumbents. Now, incumbents have all sorts of tremendous advantages. Um, Mr. Black is absolutely right about that. I mean, money and voter behavior. But this doesn't help things. You might know that the Racine District um, 21 was the most competitive district in the, in the state assembly. I'm sorry, the uh, state senate. And it would go back and forth and back and forth. Um, I don't have the figures in front of me, but it went Republican and Democratic. Excuse me, and then Republican again. Um, and 22, although it was more stable, it was fairly close. Uh, the elections were never blowouts. And what you achieved in the remap, redistricting, is that what was Racine and its suburbs, Kenosha and its suburbs, become inner city Kenosha, inner city Racine, and then all the suburbs. So you have one super democratic district and one super republican district. Neither of them will ever be, with this map, competitive again. So what used to be two fairly competitive districts are now zero competitive districts. At the federal level, um, this is just showing what the overall vote is and then the margin, the breakdown of the congressional districts. And you can see through successful gerrymandering, this by Republicans, and they just simply had more procedures they controlled. This is by Democrats. Illinois and Maryland were controlled by Democrats and they did the same thing. Maryland, even more dramatically, um, the vote was in Maryland, you know, about 60% Democratic and they took nearly 80% of the seats. Um, but look at Pennsylvania. Um, you know, it's, it's roughly, the vote was about 53 or so percent Democratic, and the Republicans got 70, almost three quarters of the seats by the way they're drawn. Um, now, this, this isn't, uh, obviously it's not illegal, and, and what it does, though, is it serves the parties, it serves politicians, it serves incumbents, um, if the purpose of elections is to uh, have some procedure to accurately reflect the will of the people, I'm not sure that's a big priority here. Um, people are sort of bystanders in, in an inside baseball game. Uh, there's the numbers, I don't expect you to read them all, but this is in gerrymandered states, and, and there's uh, Pennsylvania, 50.8% Democratic overall vote, 49.2% Republican vote, 
and yet the um, the distribution of seats was five Democratic and thirteen Republican. That takes a lot of work to do that. Um, Wisconsin 50.8, 49.2, and yet you know the, the split was 62 percent, 37 percent of seats in in the in the um, in the congressional delegation. Here's again, this isn't we're focusing on Wisconsin here, and this isn't state government, but here's the layout of the commission drawn states. This is the states that took it from the politicians and is either drawn by the courts in a, in a fairly neutral way uh, or done by a court panel directly by the courts or by commission. And certainly not perfect. And, there, and let me say, there's other factors that go into who wins elections. And some of these delegations are small, so don't pay attention to the, uh, don't pay too much attention to the percentages. But you can see, for example, in Iowa, our neighbor in the model for the reform efforts here, 51, uh, 48, and it's two and two, each have 50% of the seats. Nevada, 50-50, the seats are 50-50. New Jersey was 55 Democratic, 44 Republican, the seats are 50-50. Washington's 54-45, the seats are 60-40. Um, Arizona, is the reverse of that. The Democrats have a slight advantage in the seats, but they're all kind of close. They're reflecting, because they're fairly and kind of randomly drawn, they're reflecting the, the outcome of the race a little more closely. Here in Wisconsin, we've already talked about this, but you, you have that um, kind of carefully gerrymandered seats. Um, it is true that the Democrats have some natural gerrymandering going on. They live more densely in city areas, Democratic voters, and so that certainly is a uh, case, but it was, um, it was exacerbated intensely here. And so, uh, I'm almost done here, you can see uh, this is the change in margin after gerrymandering. So this is 2010 and this is 2012. You can see that Democrats won by much higher margins in their district. Why? Because their districts were purified into pretty much just Democrats in a lot of places. And Republican margins went down um, because there's more seats of theirs with Democrat, Democratic voters kind of split up a little bit in, in their districts. Um, it's the math of it means that they're going to win more seats by a lower margin. And then you can see in the, the, the other thing it achieved is to make vulnerable Republicans a little stronger and vulnerable Democrats in, in worse shape. So if you do the math on this, essentially um, the result of packing so many Democratic voters is to dilute the power of the electoral power of each Democratic vote so that it takes 1.7 votes to have the same electoral impact as one Republican vote. Now in Maryland and Illinois, I suspect it was just the reverse. And the Republican voters got screwed just as royally. And you might say, oh, it'll all come out in the end. But this isn't necessarily to be a game between parties. Um, so last slide, or second to last slide, this was in 2008. Uh, I just showed you what the, what the uh, margin was in the 2012. 2008, the courts drew the, this, this isn't the reform that that um, Common Cause is calling for, um, and Senator Schultz's bill calls for, but it was kind of the same spirit, which is let's draw these neutral things and not pay too much attention to the party. And you can see that the um, total votes for the assembly in 2008 kind of were in the neighborhood and matched the distribution of seats in 2008. Here's Iowa, counties are kept together. This is their federal congressional districts. Uh, counties are kept together, um, and, and we talked about how it's two and two there. Three of the four races are competitive. Three, uh, the first, second, and third districts are all very competitive. Um, the Iowa General Assembly, which is drawn the same way by the same rules, is 47 Democratic, 53 Republican seats. The Iowa Senate 26, 24. Again, there's other reasons for this, but the correlation is clear. When you draw districts to be competitive, they will be competitive. Um, you may have seen this in the isthmus. This is what um, Wisconsin would look like for districts federally if they were drawn with the Iowa rules and, and the state legislature. So I will leave it at that, uh, just to give you a, a sense of how gerrymandering works and what it looks like. <laughs>